morning. And with this, Elizabeth, thank you for joining us. And I'm going to just mute my microphone now and hover in the background. The, the webinar is all yours. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for being here this afternoon. And um, so yes, I have spent five years with working with the Great Smoky Mountains National Park to do a retrospective assessment of their program. And um, first, I just want to thank them because they have an amazing resource. And um, I'll, provide, I'll present lots of non-target risk studies. And we're really fortunate in Hemlock because there's been a, you know, a lot of work. And that gives us the ability to know a lot about non-target risks in these systems. Um, so, so much of this information is possible because numerous people have been working in these systems. So to start, I'll cover HWA and Hemlock. And then pause for a minute and give a little bit of perspective on insecticide use. And just frame the discussion, because there's lots of controversy and concern over the use of pesticides. Then go into further detail on specific environmental risks of imidacloprid that we know from previous studies, cover the water quality assessment in the Smokies, and then discuss new dosage recommendation for different size hemlocks, and briefly cover a couple of treatment options. So first of all, we have a forest resource, and that is eastern hemlock. This is a very iconic tree in eastern forest. It has a wide range from Canada all the way south to northern Georgia and northern Alabama. And one thing that makes this a little bit different than other trees is hemlock has a very distinctive ecological niche. It's a slow-growing, long-lived, shade-tolerant, evergreen species. And it's a keystone species in its habitat. <clears throat> Hemlocks condition the soil that they're living in. They shade streams, which reduces um, water temperature. This makes distinctive stream habitat for brook trout and aquatic insect species. And in fact, distinctive aquatic insect species are associated with hemlock forest. Um, and unfortunately, the ecological role of hemlock um, can't be filled by another tree species. For instance, when we had um, American chestnut decline and, and die off in eastern forest, there were other native species that could at least in part fill that gap. Not totally, but in part. But that is not the case with eastern hemlock. So its preservation is, is very important. And um, unfortunately, we have a forest health problem, and that is hemlock woolly adelgid, or HWA. This is an invasive species that is native to Japan. It was introduced into the eastern United States in the 1950s, but really began rapid spread in the 1980s. HWA is a great invader, um, two generations each year, for, so more opportunities for, re, um, for egg production. And female males lay somewhere between 50 and 300 eggs. So rapid, rapid population growth. Unfortunately, there are no effective native natural enemies to, to suppress these populations. And hemlock doesn't really have any resistance to HWA, um, as is the case with other hemlock species. And as a result, there's been widespread hemlock mortality in eastern forest. And just taking a peek at that life cycle, there's a shorter generation of progridians in the spring, and then a longer generation the systems that occurs from summer all the way back into spring again. And notice on the left-hand side, estivating nymph. So the nymphs go through estivation phase um, during the summer, and that's because hemlocks are not as active during the summer. They're not moving fluid as much. So everything kind of calms down during the summer. And that's something to think about when you're applying pesticides, um, especially systemic applications, because we want to do that when the trees are moving the fluids. But to look at HWA, so these are some pictures that I took under the scope last winter. And the yellow, the orange oval shapes are the eggs. And I've teased away the um, woolly mass to give a view of that. Once the eggs hatch, the first instar is a crawler. And here's a closer picture. This is the only mobile phase of HWA. So the crawler moves around and finds an ideal spot on the branch. 
It may be that they're picked up by birds or other wildlife and moved to other areas in the forest. Once the crawler finds the location it wants, usually at the base of the needle, it will settle, insert its piercing sucking mouth part, so like a large, long straw, and it doesn't move anymore. She puts her, her mouth part in and begins to suck fluid out of the hemlock tree and begins to grow, produce the wool, and lay eggs. And so thousands and thousands of these HWA are drawing fluids out from the tree, which is depleting it of resources, and, um, and we end up with graying foliage, canopy thinner, thinning, dead branches, and eventually a dead hemlock tree. And this is what a heavy infestation looks like. And um, so you think about this, it, it's not surprising that um, these hemlock trees are dying. So we're talking about saving a hemlock tree, but what is the real resource? It's not just the tree, it's the entire hemlock system. It's the plants that are dependent on the hemlocks, the water and the streams and the fish and aquatic insects that are there because the hemlock is there. So this is a not a tree issue, but a forest system issue. And so the view I'll take with the rest of this is to have a systemic kind of perspective. What are we doing and how does it affect the entire system? There are numerous options for HWA management and I'll cover these in a little bit more information later on, a little more detail later on, um, but lots of, lots of tools that can be used. And the last on the list is do nothing. And when we do nothing, we end up with dead trees. And just as using pesticides or any other kind of management tactic can have um, effects and negative and positive effects on the system, doing nothing has negative effects as well. So we're looking at a lot of dead hemlocks in the landscape. But if we think a little bit closer in, with the dead trees, we get cascading ecological effects because the hemlocks are no longer there. So that's a trade-off as well. But to cover the pesticides being used, primarily neonicotinoids, so this is a newer class of insecticide that were created and released, um, was really released in the early 90s. And they were created because they have a better vertebrate profile. And so what that means is that there was some concern about previous classes of insecticides and how toxic or how harmful they are to vertebrates. So fish, birds, people. Neonics um, are different. They're, they're developed because they have lower toxicity to vertebrates. They've been licensed in more than 100 countries with over a $26 billion global market. 41% of that is imidacloprid, but that's because it's the first pesticide, insecticide from this class that was released. It's off patent now, which really helps with the cost of the product. And there are other neonicotinoids as well that are available. So imidacloprid is the most commonly one, com the one most commonly used for HWA suppression. It is applied by systemic applications. And what that means is that a solution of imidacloprid is applied to the soil around the base of the tree or on the bark of the tree. It's absorbed by the tree root or by the bark and translocated through the xylem up into the canopy where HWA feeds. And imidacloprid does persist in hemlock for many years and provides a longer term um, control option, not long term, but a longer term. And that is because once imidacloprid is applied, it is metabolized into plants into numerous compounds, and one of those is olefin. Olefin is over 10 times more toxic to insects than imidacloprid, and it's more persistent. And that's why we have that longevity of control using this product. So let's think about insecticides. Again, let's, let's frame this discussion and see how we're thinking about these products. An insecticide is a chemical substance that is used to kill insects. So it is toxic. That's why it works. Um, if we're going to use a product to kill an organism, it has to be toxic to that organism and often to a suite of organisms. And so if it were not toxic, it wouldn't be used for these purposes. So that's just, that's just part of it. And so when we talk about something being toxic, there's a hazard to it. 
And you know, what is a hazard? We deal with hazards every day. We get in the car and drive. We allow our kids to swim in the pool. Um, so there are things that we deal with that are hazardous. Some things have a high hazard and some things have a low hazard, or high toxicity and low toxicity. For instance, water is not very toxic, but ethanol, drinking alcohol, is toxic. And I know we don't think about that very often. And I mentioned those because I'll use them as an example. So when we start looking at hazards or toxicities, what we really need to think about is risk. And a risk is the amount of hazard times the exposure. So yes, this compound is hazardous. How much are we getting? So water is not very hazardous at all. And we have to have it to survive. But the exposure makes a difference. If you drank 10 gallons of water, so you have the low hazard with a high exposure, there can be some health risks, and in fact, you can die from having too much water. Think about ethanol. People like to have a beer. But if you have too much of that toxic substance, there's a high risk of negative effects. And you think about risk and, and lethal concentrations and, and what it might take to, to kill an organism, but there are also sublethal effects as well. So maybe somebody has a certain amount of alcohol and begins to experience sublethal effects of that toxic substance. So maybe lack of coordination and mental confusion. And we don't typically think of things in those frames, but looking at an insecticide, it's a hazard. There's amount of exposure. A little bit of exposure may end up having some sublethal effects, possibly no effects if the exposure is low enough. And higher exposure with the exposure increases the risk. We can't avoid risk. And any time we use any sort of management tactic, there are some associated risks. There are positive and negative aspects of any choice that we make to manage a system. And we need to focus on minimizing those risks. So, um, you know, what is the risk of doing something? What is the risk of not doing something? Are the risks reasonable? Are the risks unreasonable? If the risks are not reasonable, if they are too great and there's this imbalance between a risk and a benefit, that's when we say, wait a minute. We need to think about this tactic. Is this a responsible tactic? Do we need to use this tactic for control? A non-target impact is a negative effect on things that are not the intended target. So there's an easy one to use in hemlocks. HWA is feeding in the canopy, and we want to kill it. But there are also other canopy arthropods that are feeding on fluids and foliage. Any effects to them are a non-target impact. And a trade-off is a situation in which you must choose between or balance two things that are opposite or cannot be had at the same time. So it's not very reasonable to apply an insecticide to a tree to kill HWA and then not to expect any effects on other canopy-dwelling arthropods that are feeding on fluids just like HWA is. And so those are the trade-offs that we have to think of. And hemlock, it's easy, it's easy to assess this trade-off. If the hemlock canopy is not there, then the habitat for canopy arthropods goes away as well. So that's an easy one, but these conversations are not always so easy. And let's go a little bit further into the insecticide issue because there's lots of public concern about insecticide use right now. And that comes from a place where people are concerned about what they put in the environment and what, they, what kind of chemicals are in the food that they consume. And that's a good thing. This, uh, this concern is good. We need to be concerned about those things. Unfortunately, the public is bombarded with bad information and pseudoscience. And many people often don't have the background knowledge to filter through those things very well. And if you get on the internet or Facebook, you've seen this kind of stuff all over the place. You know, there's good information out there and there's bad information out there. And the take home on this is be very careful where you get your information. Where we need to look is at the consensus of scientific information. What is the research showing? And there are a lot of wonderful researchers out there doing really good work to try to find the answers to these questions. But to cover bees, because it's a minocloprid, it's a neonic, and there is concern. And we get things like colony collapse disorder thrown around a lot. Um, so colony collapse was first reported in 2006. It's a disappearance of adult bees with no dead bodies. 
there's evidence of recent brood rearing, so the young are being taken care of, the queen is left behind, but the bees are just gone. And this occurred in 2006, and uh, our first got reported, and was reported for a few years afterwards, but those reports have really gone down, so it's not still happening like it was at that time. And in fact, incidents of bee losses have plagued beekeepers for years, and if you'd like additional information, this is an excellent article in American Bee Journal, and I'd recommend um, a good starting point to understand these things a little bit better. But there have been some bee declines, and I'll make this argument later on, but really, um, honeybees are a managed product, managed by people. And it's good to see the concern to start to shift toward native pollinators, which are probably a much better um, gauge of system health overall. It takes the human element out of maintaining the hives and seeing you know, what's happening in this system. But there are lots of things that are contributing to colony health. Um, tracheomites and varomites were introduced to the United States in the 1980s. Poor nutrition, lack of genetic diversity, migratory beekeeping, diseases, viral, fungal, bacterial. And, you know, there are lots of things. Pesticides is on this list as well. And Rich Coles from Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station did an excellent webinar during the spring, and for more information, I would suggest look, looking at that, um, and it's specific to in these four systems with these pesticides. But there are lots of pieces to this puzzle, and pesticides are one of the pieces, but the evidence is showing that it's really one of the smaller pieces to the puzzle. And in fact, looking at bee declines over time, and this is FAO data, um, there's a reduction in hives beehives in the U.S. in the 80s, and that's with the Meyer intro introductions. Colony collapse in the you know, 2006-2008 range, and there's since been an increase in those numbers. So um, that's just for some perspective, and again, these are honeybee numbers and not native pollinators. For every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And I think that the public has grabbed onto this and the cloprid is killing all the bees idea. Because it is clear, it's very simple, it's easy to buy into, but it's not really the direction we need to go in. There are numerous challenges, um, and it's best to focus on what the scientific evidence says are the big players in this. However, hemlocks are not pollinated by insects, so as far as um, the imidacloprid treatments and that direct con connection between the hemlock and the pollinator, breathe a sigh of relief. They're not, they're not pollinated by insects, so that removes one of those concerns. But it's good to mention in light of public concern, and if you're working for a state and federal agent or federal agency, um, public perception and public concern is very important in your job. So next questions, um, how toxic is imidacloprid, and what does it do in a hemlock forest? First, how imidacloprid works. So imidacloprid is a neonicotinoid. That means it's very chemically similar to nicotine, and it interacts in an insect's nervous system in a similar manner. They both bind to the same nerve receptor. So vertebrates have these nerve receptors as well, but the imidacloprid molecule fits better with the receptor in insects. And that means it takes less imidacloprid to cause a negative effect in insects. It doesn't fit as well with the receptors in vertebrates, and that's why it has a much safer profile. And we see this when we look at acute toxicity, or LC50 concentrations, and that's the concentration required to kill 50% of a test population. So the figure shows imidacloprid in parts per billion on the y-axis and different test organisms on the x-axis. And looking at the large bars, that means more uh, imidacloprid is required you have a negative effect. The bigger the bar, the more product that you need to cause a problem. And these big bars showing low toxicity are vertebrates. And then the invertebrates you know, require much less to cause a negative effect. So let's take a closer look. Uh, imidacloprid LC50 for HWA is about 125 parts per billion. But then coronamid, okay, so that's an aquatic fly. And it's 
much more sensitive to imidacloprid. And in fact, looking at the literature and the LC50 for numerous aquatic taxa, we see that aquatic insects in general are much more sensitive to imidacloprid. So as far as looking at environmental risk and what organisms are most sensitive, this is a really good place to focus because they are so sensitive. Once imidacloprid is applied, it begins to break down in the environment. That's strongly influenced by method of application. If it's poured into the soil or if it's sprayed on the trunk of a tree, that's going to affect how imidacloprid breaks down. Imidacloprid does photodegrade very quickly, and so that's a good thing. We like post pesticides that photodegrade quickly if they're sitting out in the environment. They can do what they need to do and then um, break down. The metabolism pathways in plants, water, and soil are different, but are, they, they do end up producing similar um, metabolites sometimes. This is a breakdown of imidacloprid in plants. So highlighted are the compounds that do have um, insecticidal properties. Dihydroxy and 5-hydroxy are transient compounds. They don't hang around as long, but olefin is, again, persistent and very toxic. These are not the breakdown compounds that we find commonly in soil and water. The literature indicates that those compounds that are on the right side, some of those do appear in soil and water, but not the ones, or I haven't found the ones in any literature searches that are insecticidal. Midicloprate gets applied to the soil. So, you know, what are some possible effects? There could be some impacts to soil arthropods. Is it isolated to where the insecticide is poured, which is a pretty reasonable um, risk? Does it extend out from there? It's expected that the tree takes up imidacloprid, so again, that possible impact to non-target canopy arthropods. Imidacloprid can move through the soil with possible impacts to surface water quality and aquatic insects. And it can be taken up by non-target plants with possible impacts to pollinators. Um, a couple of points to make. The area where this would actually occur would be where some kind of a, a flowering plant is growing right in the zone where those imidacloprid treatments are being applied. So it wouldn't be every rhododendron in the forest or every um, mountain laurel in the forest, but very isolated few of them. Another thing to consider is that imidacloprid gets moved through transpiration, and it, that moves water to leaves all the time, where floral structures get produced and fluids and imidacloprid isn't getting translocated constantly to that flower like it's getting translocated to the leaves. So the leaves act like a sink. And in fact, when we've done some preliminary data analysis, concentrations observed in the leaves of non-target plants are much higher than concentrations that we see in the flowers. However, um, grant proposals are in to fund this specific, specific piece of the puzzle. So hopefully in a couple of years, um, I can have more specific answers. Canopy arthropods, so what are the risks there? Two studies have been conducted looking at canopy arthropods and imidacloprid treatments by Dilling et al. and then Kung et al. in 2014. First one looked at a shorter term effect, so looking at treated trees versus untreated trees within the first two years of treatment. Lower abundance for both imidacloprid, for imidacloprid treated trees occurred compared to control. So lower abundance, less insects in the trees that were treated with imidacloprid, and, and we kind of expect that, as well as lower species richness and imidacloprid trees. And this isn't a surprise, because they're feeding on the place where the target pest feeds as well. However, Kung et al. looked at imidacloprid treated trees three and nine years after treatment, so a longer term view, and found no difference in species richness, and in fact, in one um, instance found higher species richness nine years after treatment. So looking at trade-offs and risks to canopy arthropods, this seems like a pretty reasonable bet and a pretty um, safe option. Let's see if I can get the slide to change. All right, movement in soil. So we're, we're not in the target area now, we're in the soil. Imidacloprid does bind to organic material. 
and it moves less in rich soil, and it's more persistent in rich soil. So soil with high organic material. Soils with steep slopes and low organic material, this is where we expect more leaching because imidacloprid can't bind as well to those soils. So something to consider in your treatment programs, especially if you're close to water. A study was conducted and published in 2012 looking at imidacloprid effects in soil specifically to hemlock systems and found that, the, yes, there is vertical movement of imidacloprid downward into the soil, but horizontal movement, so side to side, moving away from the application site and moving laterally in that soil was very limited. And there was no difference in soil mark microarthropods between treated trees and untreated trees. So again, impact to soil uh, biota seems pretty reasonable. Um, not seeing negative effects, that would be of great concern. And then in water, because this is something we're really concerned about. Imidacloprid can be treated, transmitted to water by numerous methods, drift, wind erosion, and that's more in agricultural settings. And in this forest setting, runoff and leaching are more of a concern. Again, imidacloprid photodegrades very quickly, so in clear water, it, it's not expected to um, persist very long. Is it affected by shade and turbidity? Does that affect degradation rates? Um, I would think so, but typically these studies on photodegradation in water is done in light and dark conditions, and those other variables are not taken into consideration. And imidacloprid can move more quickly in preferential flow paths. So if you're treating somewhere and there's a rock shelf and the, there's not much organic material and there's lots of rocks, imidacloprid can't bind to that material and will be more likely to run off. Previous to the work done in the Smokies, there was one study looking at the aquatic insect risks of imidacloprid use. Um, imidacloprid was treated, trees were treated with imidacloprid about 30 per stream, or 30 per side of stream, so four streams, trees in the riparian area given soil applications, 30 on each side of the stream for a total of 60 trees. And the, the system was assessed for two years with water and aquatic insect or macroinvertebrate samples. One sample did come back positive for imidacloprid with concentrations less than one part per billion, and that was right at two years after treatment. There were no negative effects to the macroinvertebrates, and the streams all had excellent water quality. So on a shorter term range, um, 60 trees treated per stream, no negative effects were observed. And that brings us to the water quality assessment in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, and again, this is an amazing opportunity to assess imidacloprid in these systems. This is a map of the National Park. All of the streams in the study are highlighted in black. All of the shapes that are in white are locations where samples were collected. So quite a lot of samples collected during the study covering numerous streams. And the questions to answer are, you know, is imidacloprid present in surface waters as a result of HWA imidacloprid treatments? And are aquatic macroinvertebrate communities negatively affected by this HWA management tactic? To set up the study, imidacloprid treatment areas were designated. So this is retrospective, so the, the treatment areas, um, the treatment areas were um, already treated before we initiated the study. And that's indicated by a red rectangle. And it represents an area where soil applications occurred in these riparian areas using a 10-foot setback from the stream channel and never exceeding the maximum rate per acre. There were 10 such treatment areas with a wide range of sizes and between 100 and 1,000 trees per treatment area. So increasing the size of those treatment areas, looking at larger areas being treated. Samples were collected for water downstream, upstream, and downstream is where we would expect to see an impact, and then an adjacent stream as an additional control. Surface water samples were collected once at each location, 
and were analyzed for the presence and concentration in parts per trillion. The detection limit was 15 parts per trillion, so very low. For imidacloprid and also olefin, as I said earlier, olefin is not one of the main breakdown products in water, but there was some concern that with these hemlocks that had been treated, and some of them didn't survive because they they were too heavily infested when they were first treated, or leaves falling into the channel and breaking down, that olefin, which is much more toxic, could possibly impact surface water. What we found is that olefin was not detected in any samples, again, which is not surprising. Imidacloprid was not detected in upstream or adjacent stream control samples. However, imidacloprid was present in downstream sites. So it's there. You know, what do we have? The stream name is on the left, so all of the streams that were assessed, and the concentration in parts per trillion are on the right. Below LOD means below level of detection, so we couldn't um, detect anything at 15 parts per trillion. So 10 streams, seven of them did have positive detections of imidacloprid, um, and then of those seven, six of them were below 100 parts per trillion, but one of them was a bit higher. That's Dunn Creek at 379 parts per trillion. So we have it. Let's put this concentration in perspective. The US EPA has um, limits for imidacloprid in surface waters. There is an, a chronic limit, which is 1,050 parts per trillion. So this is something that would occur during ambient conditions, so a lower concentration with a higher exposure rate. The acute limit is much higher at 34 parts per billion, so we're not there. But the, the chronic is 1,050 parts per trillion. And the range of values observed in the study are 28 to 379. So none of the samples were close to or even really approaching the EPA limit. We know it's there. We know it's below the limit. Is it causing a problem? Similar setup, this time using nine streams. We had to drop one treatment area because of low flow conditions, a downstream, upstream sample, as well as baseline data collected from the park in the mid-90s before HWA or imidacloprid was ever an issue in the park, um, collected by the same sampling methods and within two weeks in the calendar date to control for seasonal effects. Organisms that I targeted were sensitive aquatic taxa, so stoneflies and caddisflies, and sensitive meaning that they, these organisms typically do not tolerate poor water quality conditions. So these are the organisms that um, really indicate how healthy the stream is. First of all, our overall comparison, comparing upstream and downstream samples overall, as well as baseline to downstream, um, using t-tests. So big picture, is there a problem? This was done looking at six different community measures, abundance, richness, dominance, shade of diversity, evenness. We wanted to look at the community from lots of different angles to see can we pick up any differences, as well as mean tolerance values. And these are some things that we don't encounter very often, but tolerance values are used very commonly in water quality assessment. Each taxa is given a value based on how sensitive that organism is to poor water quality. Values range from zero, which is very sensitive, to 10, which is very tolerant. So a very sensitive organism has to have clean water conditions. A very tolerant one can live in very nasty water. All of the values for mean tolerance are um, below two, which indicates that these organisms need good water quality conditions in order to survive. And I'll note, point out that baseline samples have less comparisons, and that's because they were restricted to species lists, so we don't have abundance data, which limits the comparisons that could be made. And looking at all of these different community measures, no significant differences were observed. So big picture, not seeing a problem. But let's take a closer look at pairwise comparisons that do individual upstream-downstream comparisons to see if we can tease out any effects. So I'm showing the data from the six streams. Six of the streams where imidacloprid was positive. One of the streams that had a positive detection had to be removed from the study because the flow conditions weren't conducive to aquatic insect sampling. These comparisons are based on three of those diversity indices, 
And we have three possibilities here. There could be no difference between an upstream and downstream location. And sometimes that may occur, but I don't expect it for every comparison because the length of these treatment areas are between, we've got between 0.2 and a little over six miles between these upstream downstream locations. So these streams are flowing through different types of forests, so lots of inputs that affect the species that are present. So while I don't expect to have no difference at every comparison, what I really want to look for is a lower diversity downstream. If lower diversity was observed in downstream locations for a majority of these sites, that would indicate that maybe something's going on. That's a problem. But what we see, and using blue bars to save you from a bunch of p-values, is that two of the streams, Chastain and Indian Creeks, had no difference between upstream and downstream locations. Kingfisher and Shock Creek, two streams, had lower diversity downstream. And two streams, uh, Dunn Creek and Alum Creek, had lower diversity in the upstream location. And I'll point out Dunn Creek because that's where the positive imidacloprid sample of 379 parts per trillion was observed. And in fact, that location has higher diversity downstream where that, um, where that sample was collected which indicates that the concentration observed at that point collected during normal flow conditions is not problematic to the organisms living in that stream as far as we can detect. And I'll mention that I also looked at functional feeding groups, so how the different organisms feed, as well as life habits, different how they move around the system, to try to tease out if I could you know, find any differences, and I did not. Back to that reasonable risk question. Yes, imidacloprid was detected in seven downstream locations. Concentrations were below US EPA benchmarks, and no negative impacts were observed in the aquatic macroinvertebrate communities, looking at it from numerous different angles. So this advocates for responsible pesticide use. Again, the maximum rate per acre were, was not exceeded, stream setbacks were used, and doing a, an assessment, the, no negative um, impacts were observed. So when we're looking at this from a system setting, you know, we, we don't want to see impacts to aquatic macroinvertebrates or streams or water quality. And, um, and in fact, we're not. So that risk is reasonable and can give you confidence if you're worried about these treatments, as long as you use the products reasonably. And then moving on to the tree and some treatment issues. How long does imidacloprid suppress HWA? And based on the studies done the Smokies, we see in trees that were assessed numerous years after treatment up to seven years, we see five to seven years after treatment with pesticide residue and low HWA populations. Possibly longer, this study ended at seven years, so I won't speak to times further than that, although other researchers have seen success um, in excess of seven years post-treatment. And what about dosage for different size trees? Um, can we be more smart in how we use these pesticides? So to lay out the study, 103 trees that were four to six years post-treatment were sampled for the data assessed in this part of the study. Hemlock branchlets were collected through the entire canopy to look at HWA populations and imidacloprid and olefin concentrations. Hemlocks were organized into th four different size classes, 12, 18, 24, and 30 inches dBH. A low dose was given to the smaller hemlocks, 0.7 grams active ingredient for every inch dBH. Larger hemlocks in the 30 inch size class received 1.4 grams active ingredient per inch dBH. That dosage change occurs right around 25 inches dBH. So the 24 inch size class was made of trees that either got a high or a low dose treatment, the majority of which probably did get the high dose treatment. So what did we find in the foliage? This is the midacloprid concentration in different diameter hemlocks. So the midacloprid concentration is in parts per billion on the y-axis, and the hemlock diameter, 12, 18, 24, and 30 is on the x-axis. So the larger the bar means that more pesticide residue was observed in the tissues. So first to point out that imidacloprid concentrations are significantly lower looking at 
the 18 inch, the 45 centimeter or 18 inch size class. So smaller trees tend to have lower pesticide residues compared to the larger trees, some of those differences being significant. And be mindful that these larger trees also received higher imidacloprid doses. The LC50 for imidacloprid, again for HWA, is 125 parts per billion. So four to six years after treatment, that concentration is no longer present in hemlock foliage. Moving on to olefin, same setup, concentration in parts per billion and hemlock diameter on the y-axis. And so again, we see that same trend where the larger trees have higher concentrations of olefin, of the pesticide product, significantly lower concentrations in that 18-inch size class. The LC50 for HWA is six parts per billion. So larger size trees still have that concentration present. And what this means is at some point, a land manager will walk out on a site. And some of the trees will be ready to get treated again, and some of them will not. And so this is a system that can be more efficient. And that makes us wonder, you know, are these higher doses for larger trees really necessary, looking at a multi-year perspective? But we need to know what's happening on the tree, so how successful were the treatments? HWA populations were extremely low. Control was excellent. So we also have the situation where we've got, for smaller trees, concentrations of imidacloprid and olefin below the LC50, but still excellent suppression. So what, there's a couple options that might be happening. It could be that, you know, we're looking at a hazard, but a long, an exposure time. So the LC50 numbers are based on two to three week lab studies. But HWA is exposed to these compounds in the field for multiple months. So it may be that as time goes on and they're exposed longer, the concentration necessary for mortality is lower. We also have two insecticidal compounds that have the same mode of action in the tree at the same time. So there may be an issue of an additive effect. And this, um, at this point, you know, we have those questions about, do we really need to use these, large, these higher dose applications? And this is where I partnered with collaborator Richard Coles from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And we knew that there is a predictable relationship in this data set and the amount of olefin and imidacloprid found in foliage. And we've got data numerous years after treatment for hemlocks of different size classes. So we know how much is in these different size trees. And the question is, you know, how can this information be used to improve management decisions? And what we ended up de developing, largely through Rich's experience with pesticides, is an equation for optimum dose. And this is just based on hemlocks that were five years post-treatment. So this is the optimum dose by each hemlock DBH size. Um, and since it's based on hemlocks five years post-treatment, we expect these effects and these pesticide con target pesticide concentrations to be present five years post-treatment. So what does it look like? The amount of imidacloprid applied, grams per tree, is on the x-axis, and the hemlock diameter is on the y-axis. So first notice the dotted line. That's the traditional dose, where smaller hemlocks are given less imidacloprid, and then that dose doubles around 25 inches dBH. Although I will say some labels recommend doubling the dose at 15 inches dBH, so it just depends on which product you're using. Um, but doing that optimized dose using the equation we see that much smaller amounts of imidacloprid can be used, especially on the larger trees, although a little bit you know, smaller levels on some of these, lower levels on some of these smaller trees. What does this mean? This means that when going out to treat a tree and it's, you know, 30 inches dBH, 32 inches dBH, that pesticide can get saved, a lot of it, and can be applied to other trees on the acre. Because we're all limited in how much imidacloprid we can apply to an acre. We can't treat every tree in high density stands. So 181 grams or 0.4 pounds of active ingredient is the maximum amount of imidacloprid that can be applied to an acre. If we save amount being applied to larger trees, that means that that pesticide can either be used on smaller trees in that acre or it can also um, be savings in pesticide costs. 
Um, so I will, this is a picture I took out in the field with the Tennessee Division of Forestry. They are implementing this dosage recommendation on about 800 acres this year. And this is um, a way that they easily keep track with how much to add to each tree. I sent them a spreadsheet. They copied it and taped it onto their DBH tape. But you can also take a Sharpie and write those values down on the tape. So for instance, an 11-inch tree would get 7 ounces of product. And this is based on a 1 gram active ingredient per ounce mixture of imidacloprid. Um, Rich Coles and I have written a re an outreach document. It will be available soon. It's in peer review right now. That's very specific on how to apply this dosage model, this dosage recommendation for different sized trees using different application methods and very specific information on how to mix the product. And so once this is um, available, Peter will send it out to everybody. So that's something to look forward to. What we know from the hemlock assessment is that HWA is suppressed up to seven years post-treatment. Smaller hemlocks are ready for additional treatments first. But imidacloprid can be optimized based on the diameter. And optimizing doses means more trees can be treated or financial resources and pesticide costs can be saved. And really, the, the overall goal is, again, not to preserve a hemlock tree, but to have a healthy hemlock forest. And so responsible use of pesticides, using setbacks, um, using smart dosing, those are all measures that we can take to ensure a healthy hemlock forest. But there are some other treatment options, so what about those? Um, let's walk through this just a little bit. Again, the HWA management options, and I won't cover all of these, but <clears throat> again, we also have the option of doing nothing, which does have negative effects. And a way to think about this are, you know, what tools are in the toolbox? There are numerous tools that we can take out. <laughs> and which tool we use depends on our management plans, what are our goals and objectives for a plot of land or a site, what are our financial, um, logistic, and regulatory restrictions. And so those are all things to consider. Again, looking at the traditional soil applications, and these are all the impacts that we have to think about. And although research shows that um, all of these risks are, are very reasonable and, in fact, have not shown negative impacts on a lot of these things, there is also the possibility of doing a basal bark spray. And that does reduce some of the risk in these systems. So let's look at that again. We can reduce some of the risks based on the application method. And which method you, you take is really tailored to each program and what their needs are. And I'll, I'll very quickly mention something about biocontrol just to frame when we might want to use this tactic. Because um, there can be some confusion in biocontrol, and we, and we have people you know, trying to use it when maybe they should consider a different option. So let's think about a landscape. We've got a big forest, and there's a biocontrol release site where beetles are released, hundreds of beetles, sometimes thousands, over the course of time. And these beetles have to reproduce and um, distribute themselves throughout the environment. And sometimes there's a lot of prey out there for them, and it's a numbers game. And biocontrol, the perspective to take of this is slow building of a population over time. So it's a, it's a slow game. It's not a fast game. It's not always effective. It's very site specific. Um, so if your goal is to protect the hemlock trees in your yard or on your 100 acres of forest, this is probably not the best tool for your area. And really, it's a case of um, it not, not that it's not a good tool, but not using the right tool at the right time. Biocontrol is best used with experienced personnel who really understand the benefits of biocontrol, when to use it, and what the trade-offs are. And they're using this as one of the tools in a larger landscape. But it is the long-term management goal. What we all want is for this to have these increases in populations over time and have a more sustainable control method. 
but in the meantime, insecticides are necessary to protect hemlock resources. And then just quickly looking at the two different um, neonicotinoid insecticides. They're different products. They work, um, they have some different behavior in the system, and that really affects how we want to use those tools. Donatepiron moves to the canopy quickly. So within a few weeks, effective concentrations of Donatepiron are up in the canopy, um, causing H2PA mortality. Imidacloprid does not move as quickly in the canopy, and based on uh, Coots et al., I believe it's 2013, um, it takes about three or more months for effective concentrations to be present in the hemlock canopy. Um, so that affects maybe when you want to apply it, depending on what's going on with that specific hemlock. Donatetron does not work as long. It's effective for one or two years. Imidacloprid is effective for five to seven or possibly more years. So Donatetron can provide a quick, shorter term reduction of HWA, while imidacloprid does provide a longer, not long term, but longer term reduction of HWA, um, but there is a time factor that can come up. So Donatetron is really good for heavy infestations and um, you know, if the tree is heavily infested and being stressed, Dinotepiron would be a really good tool for that toolbox because it's going to get up and start suppressing HWA populations more quickly. But um, imidacloprid is best to, for light to moderate infestations. When the canopy is still healthy, it's moving um, fluids very well, which means it's going to move the pesticide. A tree that is really compromised is not moving water as well, which means that it's not going to move the slow-acting imidacloprid well. Another thing to consider for your programs is that Dinotepiron is still under patent, which means that it's more expensive. While imidacloprid is off patent and is less expensive, so it's more affordable. And products can be used together. Both products can be applied at the same time, um, and that's good, especially if you're in a remote location and you don't have the luxury of going back to that location again. Or donatefuron can be applied first for a quick HWA population reduction, and then maybe the next year follow up with imidacloprid for that longer term um, control. The product choice and the timing is going to be dependent on the resource and the management goal and um, the logistics of those areas. So, so there's not one totally right or totally wrong way to do this. As long as both products are being responsibly used, then how to integrate both of them or one of them is just very um, site or management program specific. There are numerous different application methods for dinotefuron, both in the soil and the trunk, as well as imidacloprid. Also Cortec pellets can be used, that's a slow release pellet, and that's really good for sites with accessibility issues where um, getting to water is a problem. And I will say for different states have different pesticide regulations. For instance, in New York, bare tree and shrub is, is okay for general use. That means that anybody can buy that off the, sh the shelves and apply it. But Dinotefuron and imidacloprid um, alone are a restricted use product. That means that a licensed applicator must apply them. And they actually have special local needs license um, thanks to the work of Mark Whitmore. And so there are some restrictions depending on each state. So I advise you um, with exploring this, please check on restrictions in your state to make sure that all applications are appropriate and are not in violation of any regulations. And um, for basal bark sprays, Rich Coles does have some recommendations on how to do those basal bark sprays based on his research. And so the dilution is one to 10 using a flowable product with dosage options of 0.71 and 1.4 grams active ingredient per deech for NHDBH. You need to use a control flow valve with a backpack sprayer and calibrate your applications with a stopwatch until you're familiar with the process. And so this will be available for um, greater detail perusing later on, but those are some options for basal bark sprays. And lastly, um, you know, we have these insecticide labels that can sometimes be painful to navigate, and sometimes maybe you feel like you don't get the kind of information that you want or specific enough information. But the label is the law. 
and the label is a safety fence. And that's something we don't we don't always view it that way. Sometimes safety fences are not very apparent to us. And we look at this and say, that's not a safety fence. But what if your two-year-old is in the yard? Then it becomes very obvious that this is a safety fence. And the fact is, is that sometimes we don't think about safety fences very much. Sometimes a safety fence is very obvious. And sometimes it is extremely obvious that we have a safety fence, and there's a very big reason that we have a safety fence. And that's what pesticide labels are. They're a safety fence to ensure that you're using these products safely for yourself as well as the environment. Either way, operating without a safety fence is a really bad idea. So please follow the pesticide labels on these products. Again, our goal is for a healthy hemlock forest. And if pesticides are one of the tools that we're using in that toolbox, and we've made that choice based on research and knowing that it's a responsible insecticide use, that means that we have to use the products correctly to preserve not just the tree, but the entire forest system. And with that, I will thank the National Park Service and the Forest Service for funding the research as well as Great Smoky Mountains National Park personnel for all of their help with this project, and University of Tennessee lab personnel. Um, and I hope I've gotten all of the references in here, but if you need additional references, please contact me. All of this work has been done because many different people have worked on it, so I would like to thank them for all of their efforts in these systems. Um, And I will be glad to take any questions. Elizabeth, thank you. That was an outstanding presentation. I just I think that was extremely well organized and put together and thoroughly referenced. This was um, super useful. And I'm going to, there are some questions that have come in, and this is a great time for people to start typing those in. Um, I'm going to use the host prerogative to start with some questions, though. So you had, the, the work that you did in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park was looking at the effects of imidacloprid following a soil application. And you essentially found that there were, you know, when, when used appropriately as uh, as it should be prescribed, you know, the, the risk associated with the imidacloprid was extremely low and the benefits outweighed the um, uh, uh, were, were a prevailing factor. Do you, is there any reason, and you showed the slide that, that illustrated that you would expect um, fewer pathways with a soil, I'm sorry, with the basal bark treatment, is there any reason to think that there would be any greater risk um, in any other kind of, from any other perspective with the basal bark treatment? I think if it's applied correctly, um, then that's really you know lowering some of the possible exposure routes. Although you know research does show that we're not seeing non-target effects from using the traditional soil treatments, but that does um, it may make it easier for certain agencies or entities to be able to use those treatments just because that at least that route is being removed. Okay. So all right, which is what I mean that I guess you know intuition would tell you that the risk is reduced when you take out one of the elements, which is applying it to the soil, and, and if you're doing a basal bark treatment. Um, but just I just wanted to for clarification on that. And then I have a I'll call it a curiosity question. So that first question was kind of a management question. I didn't. The, okay. So um, so my second question is, you um, you showed that. At, in your work, and you were looking um, a few years, I think five to seven or four to six years after treatment, that the smaller trees had reduced levels of imidacloprid and olefin in the foliage, um, but yet it was still effective. And so, and you had identified, you know, one explanation was that there was that the HWAs maybe had a chronic exposure, um, and that that was why they were being uh, controlled, but are the th the th so my question is: Are the how are the what was the age class of hemlock woolly adelgids that were used to determine the threshold levels for toxicity? And I'm wondering if if the juvenile 
um, the, the mobile phase of the hemoquilae adelgid, maybe you're more sensitive, and therefore those lower concentrations would be effective, or how, how what's the kind of the background on that? Usually, um, younger insects tend to be more sensitive. I mean, we, we see that. But adult HWA were used um, in the studies where they looked at toxicity. Okay. All right. So let's uh, we'll go back through some of these questions. Um, so Richard wants to know. Uh, he says since imidacloprid binds to organics in the soil, how is it absorbed by the tree? It doesn't have to be quote unquote quote free in solution to be yeah. taken up. Yeah. So what we think happens is that you know imidacloprid gets bound to the soil. It adheres to the soil. But when water comes into contact with it, it's attracted to the water in that soil matrix. And so it goes into the water from the soil and then is absorbed by the roots. And that's also why we don't recommend treating right after rainfall because we don't want your product to, to wash away. We want moist soil conditions but not, not drought, very dry conditions, and not saturated conditions. Okay. And then um, another question came in about the relative toxicity of imidacloprid between mammals versus fish and birds, and that there was that it was, you know, that that there was uh, some assumption that uh, that there was low toxicity for mammals, but it was more toxic for fish and birds. Um, looking at a lot of the studies, you know, it may be that mammals have. And in general, toxicity show, studies show you know, a little bit of a more sensitivity for birds and, um, and fish. But those, comparatively speaking, those toxicity, those tolerances are still very high. And I'll pull up. You had a slide that had, yeah, you had quail. I remember seeing quail. On. Yes, and those are typically the organisms that are studied for regulatory reasons. So it may be that there are some specific uh, birds that are, you know, more sensitive than that, some smaller birds, but we're not looking at the sensitivity like you would have with an invertebrate. Okay. All right. So that's, those are several orders of magnitude difference between the vertebrates and the invertebrates. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, another question from Richard is what fraction or percentage of the trees were able to be treated with applications um, that, that, you know, that didn't exceed the, uh, the dose per acre limit? I am not sure about that question. We're talking about a lot of acres. And so um, the data was compiled by the park as they did it. But as far as a fraction of trees per acre, I think that really depends on the acre and the size of the trees on that acre. So it would be acre specific. Um, but that's gonna depend on the density of the, the trees on that acre. And I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. Right, well, and that, I mean, that would be a hard calculation to make because you're gonna have, you know, tree diameters ranging from, you know, a few inches up to tens of inches of diameter and in various configurations. Um, I did, well, okay. Um, all right, so Mark asks, what effect would imidacloprid basal bark applications have on Laracobius or other biocontrol agents? There's been some work on that, and you know, it's an insect, so it will have an effect on it. And um, a lot of research has recently been done the last couple of years looking at how to fine tune the integration or the transfer from a pesticide managed system to a biocontrol system, and that experiment's been, those experiments were done um, and published by Mayfield at all 2015, and I'll be glad to send anybody the information on that. So, I mean, there are some risks, but generally these are not tactics that um, we expect to use at the same time, and biocontrols tend to not be released on pesticide-treated trees unless it's part, you know, of an experiment where they're looking at low-dose pesticide applications. Okay. Um, and then James asks, how many, and I don't really understand this question, so if you don't, we, we'll get clarification, yeah. but how many families of BMI, capital letters, did you look at in your upstream-downstream 
aquatic insect comparisons. You said that you mentioned stonefly and caddisflies. What about midges and mayflies? All right. So um, I was not able to look at midges. We, we were limited by time. Um, looking at stoneflies and caddisflies, over 10,000 specimens were collected and identified, and over 5,900 were identified to the genus or species level. I've identified the mayflies as well, and I'm incorporating that data into the stonefly and caddisfly data set for, um, for publication. But I had to you know, graduate, so I had to stop at some point and analyze the data so I could go to my job that was waiting on me. Um, but I looked at each EPT, so if the Meropthera, Plecoptera, Trichoptera, mayflies, um, stoneflies, and caddisflies. And from the stoneflies, I had 16 distinct taxa from seven families. And the, may, the caddis flies, I had 50 distinct taxa, 35 of those were from the species level to 19 families. And again, incorporating that mayfly data, so far I haven't seen any negative effects. And I'm still um, working on the baseline part of it, but the upstream downstream comparisons, looking at diversity, our community measures and functional feeding groups, life habits, I haven't seen any problems. Okay. And then Paul's asking about the effects of imidacloprid on the mycelium and edible mush mushrooms or myco mycorrhizal relationships. Any any fungal investigations to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge in hemlock systems. I'm sure somebody has looked at it in other systems or just from a, a pure science greenhouse type perspective, but I don't have any information to give on that. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Jason would like to know um, when you expect the outreach product to be available? Um, the outreach pr outreach product is probably, I hope, in the next month or so. Okay. And but if, if somebody needs, like, if they're wanting to implement it right now, they're welcome to send me an email at ebenton at uga.edu, and I can um, maybe help share some information for their program. But if you can wait to the outreach publication, that's probably much better. Um, it'll give you a more well-rounded view of it and, and um, just really set you up to go out and start doing those applications. Okay. And just to reiterate what you said before, when, when that becomes available, you'll provide it to me. And I have the registration database of all of the people for this webinar, so I'll directly send it to all of them, and then I'll also post it to our social media site so that other people will be able to find and track it. And I can, when we post this webinar on YouTube, I'll be able to cross-link that document with the description on YouTube. So we should be able to get pretty good distribution of it. Uh, okay, Stephen says, does imidacloprid, and I should say there's a lot of comments in here about what a great job you did, but I'm just going straight, I'm just going straight, to, just going straight to the questions. Um, <laughs> does imidacloprid have any effect on hemlock scale, uh, which is a problem in Massachusetts? No, and I did get some, I haven't worked with hemlock scale, but I did contact Rich Coles this week to get some specifics in case that did come out. Imidacloprid you know, doesn't really work on scales. Um, but dinotetron and clothianidin do, and those are both, again, neonicotinoid pesticides. Check your state registration, because in some states, clothianidin is, and it may be in general, is only registered for use in ornamentals. So if you want to use these in forest applications, be sure that that's a registered use of the product. Okay. And then Colleen wants to know about an option to inject imidacl imidacloprid or dinotefiron directly into the tree. You can do that, um, but there's really not a need. So you can do stem injections and IV, and those types of products, um, those types of applications are recommended within 10 feet of the stream channel when you're trying to preserve that right by the channel resource. Um, you know, you want to get those trees in there, but you can't treat, you don't want to pour in the soil right there. So there are options. Um, they don't always work as well as the soil applications. And with having a basal bark spray option, you know, there, that's another kind of a trade-off issue you might want to wait, make. I'd be cautious of applying anything right on top of the stream. And sometimes we have these, stream, these trees that are hanging out over the stream channel. And those are situations where I'd be very careful. Okay, so is, have you looked at foliage um, 
naturally exfoliated foliage, so as the, as the hemlock needles die and senesce just through natural processes, what is the, are, are there still levels of imidacloprid in that foliage as opposed to, to green foliage? We have not looked at that. Carlix Hoops and I batted around some ideas about doing tank studies, but we were unable, never able to do it. But we, we do know, looking at this room, that we're not picking up olefin, and that's where we were really concerned. And that's at a 15 parts per trillion level, so very low concentrations. You know, we're not finding it. So not observed it at anything that would cause any problem or observed at all. Okay. And then the final comment from James, thank you, BMI are benthic macroinvertebrates. Yeah. So I was, I was trying to come up with something to, <laughs> to fill that acronym, and thank you, James, for clarifying that. Well, that, that's all the questions. Um, Elizabeth, this was, again, a fabulous job. I think this was a, a super uh, coverage of a very complex question and problem and management situation. So um, I, I appreciate all of the time that you've put into this. And thanks to all the participants and for your very good and, and thoughtful questions. Um, Elizabeth will be back this evening at 7, so if any of you want a second go around at this, you're welcome. Um, we do have over 100 people have registered. I haven't checked recently, but there are something like 110 people that were registered about an hour ago. So we'll get another uh, 30 or 40 people this evening. So, all right. Thank you all. I'm going to turn off the recording, and Elizabeth, if you can join us back about 10 till 7, that would be super. Glad to. Thank you very much for everyone's time. All right. Yes, thank you. All right, have a great day, everyone.